So in this first lesson, looking at the progressive era and the populist movement within America, we're going to be looking firstly at political tensions in America by the 1890s, effectively. And um, as an introduction, I just want to make clear this is a first in a series of videos uh, discussing American history from the year 1890 to 1920 in the America uh, Superpower um, series uh, for A-Level. This is chapter two, so progressivism and populism within American politics. And as it should be noted that uh, this was a period of growing populist movement. Okay, and there were a number of results from this growing populist movement. Okay, there was a reaction to the power and influence of big business. So, if you note, if you remember in the last video, when we looked at chapter one, when we looked at the era uh, of the the Gilded Age of American history, and just just past Reconstruction, we find that there is a lot of uh, monopolistic monopolistic. Uh, businesses which is essentially you know where a business has complete control of a particular market they are the only um, you know company or business that um, creates commodities for that particular market and so that stifles uh, competition um, it gives them uh, it gives particular single businesses a lot of control and that's why we have uh, generally in, in the world today we have uh, antitrust legislation and competition law to try and regulate these sort of businesses from becoming too monopolistic and this is the similar thing that happened at the end of the 1890s and into the populist movement there was a reaction against this uh, influence of big business and there was also a perceived dominance of the industrial north so don't forget the south had just lost uh, the South had just lost the Civil War. The South lost the Civil War. Okay. Uh, many historians argue that the South was always going to lose the Civil War due to the infrastructure and the railways uh, and just the the general economic powers of the North. And then one of the things that you know led to the South being so uh, successful was their successful generals. But there is still an increased uh, perception of uh, industrial uh, might and industrial dominance and economic dominance from the north of America rather than in the southern states. So let's first look at big business. We mentioned big business just there. We're going to look a little bit here. Okay. So there was at first a big worry that government was seen as too weak. If you remember back in the last lesson in the Gilded Age, there was a practice of uh, laissez faire, uh, if I can spell it correctly laissez-faire government which is effectively hands-off approach so just let there be as little regulation as little legislation as possible uh, let the free market let the businesses um, do their own thing uh, and there shouldn't be really any need for a government to regulate the economy for example and this saw a kind of a there was a kind of backlash to this idea as we start to look into the progressive era okay it is uh, ill-equipped to deal with the power and influence of big business because when you have a laissez-faire uh, anti-regulation um, style of government it's a lot easier for businesses to become more and more monopolistic uh, business interests often controlled government officials so this was a, another issue that uh, existed in this period and in the Gilded Age period. We looked at the idea of corruption uh, within the in the Gilded Age lesson. There was also uh, um, the backlash from journalists, muckraking journalists, who felt that the answer to this problem was to reform politics. Political reform seemed to be the answer to the problem. And this led to an increase in power and efficiency and the accountability of government. This is what this is what they wanted when they wanted to reform uh, the political system. And an example of this uh, this journalism uh, was Ida Turbell, okay, who wrote about unfair business practices uh, perpetrated by Standard Oil. And remember, if we looked when we looked at the last lesson, Standard Oil uh, had a big monopoly, so big monopoly over the oil industry big monopoly 
in uh, January 1903, the editors uh, of uh, McClaw's magazine wrote an editorial where uh, he attacked powerful political business interests. So it became a lot more common. So anti-business, anti-big business, effectively. So anti-big business, uh, big business became more popular in this period. Became more popular. And as a result, we start to see a shift in the attitudes towards government and towards government policy. If we move on over here, there's also the state of businesses at the uh, effectively the local levels and the levels of in the individual states. So at local levels, there was reforms to try and mobilise um, sort of grassroots support for um, you know anti-corruption. So general general anti-corruption policies. Okay, so general anti-corruption corruption policies. Oops, a daisy. And yeah, so by grassroots supports, we mean uh, you know individuals at the bottom of the sort of chain in politics. So individuals uh, at local levels. Uh, you know, uh, and even a little bit higher at state levels, trying to mobilise support for general anti-corruption policies. They want to clean up city corruption within America. And local politicians paid by utility companies to give contracts in which they could uh, charge high prices and uh, offer poor services. So these uh, local politicians were effectively corrupt. And these are the people that were, um, you know, they were campaigned against. Uh, so uh, corrupt and when it comes to these corrupt local politicians there were a number of solutions that were um, uh, thought about one was to set up a regulatory commission to oversee utilities so to focus specifically on the utilities market and there was also the solution to elect town councils with professional officials and generally these solutions had a number of effects and were actually really increasingly popular because by the 1900s uh, there were over 400 uh, urban councils that had been reformed so these reforms did take place okay and then another idea for reducing corruption within the state was to increase levels of democracy that's if we go down here so at the national government measures, uh, we see there were uh, some less effective um, measures being in place. So, effectively, local government did a very good job of trying to clean up corruption within the cities. And they made some steps in this period to doing so. However, at the national level, they were less effective. So, many of the measures uh, passed were effective really ineffective in general for example the interstate commerce commission in 1887 okay had no power to regulate uh, rates from railroad companies so we also have don't forget uh oops it is it i can't draw there we go we also have railroad monopolies as well railroad monopoly monopolies okay and there was also the case where the Sherman Antitrust Act, which is a way, you know, which was effectively proposed legislation to effectively try and break up some of these monopolies, uh, that was easily negated in law. So effectively, there were a number of legal loopholes, so legal uh, loopholes available for monopolies to get around. Uh, to get around these this antitrust legislation available for monopolies so as you can see when it comes to the start of the progressive and the populist era in american politics at the end of the 1800s and into the 1900s we see a a big shift effectively a big shift in the attitude towards laissez-faire government uh, towards big business towards big monopolies 
but we don't really see very much actual reform and change at the moment. We see some good reforms and uh, you know some uh, and some good changes at the state and local levels within anti-corruption policies, especially when the uh, the local politicians' attitudes towards utility contracts. However, you don't see very much at the national level. Things like the Interstate Commerce Commission had very little power to regulate things, and also the uh, you know seemingly um, groundbreaking Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890 uh, was good, except for the fact that there were a number of legal loopholes that could lead to it being negated within the legal system.